Hello and welcome to the Spectators Alternative Conference. My name is Kate Andrews. I'm economics correspondent at The Spectator. You're watching this on Spectator TV, where the conference over the next three days is being hosted. And this morning is our economics morning, which is very kindly hosted by Barclays. This is the first panel of our digital conference, Recovery from COVID, How the UK Can Generate Jobs and growth. And of course, we know that the COVID-19 crisis has created the biggest economic contraction in the UK in 300 years, the worst of any major economy. More than 9 million workers at the height of the jobs crisis were furloughed, with many still at risk of permanent unemployment. While the OECD predicts that Britain will suffer some of the worst economic damage of any developed country. Of course, it's those who who are on low pay, still very vulnerable, that may suffer the most from this economic fallout. Now, the government has set out a three-phase plan to secure economic recovery. So far, it's included £160 billion worth to get us through this crisis, to get us through the height of it, paying almost 12 million people's wages, supporting and subsidizing business. And the chancellor has re recently promised to create new shovel-ready projects to focus on green energy, a green economy, and training for young people. But I think the question on my mind, I'm sure on many of our panelists' minds, and indeed on the public's minds, is, is this going to be enough? Uh, a lot of the uh, policies so far have been, have been brought forward, including money has been brought forward from the Conservatives' previous manifesto, but is it time to throw the whole thing out and start afresh in this very new world that we're living in? Roger, I'm going to move over to you to give your two minutes of opening remarks, and we'll come back to Tasman. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I want to start off by saying something about the current crisis and then how we get out of it. Let me begin by saying that I think that the Treasury has done a fantastic job. I'm not saying that just because Jesse is there. I think he's done a fantastic job in very difficult circumstances. And I recognise, of course, that you know, governments everywhere, including this one, face a remarkable challenge in unprecedented circumstances. Having said that, I think the first thing the government's got to do to get this economy right is get its messaging right about COVID and the way to tackle it. Uh, and this, in essence, this is not straightforward economics, actually. It's about getting the, uh, the messaging and the policies right. The government's been through the most, the most amazing contortions over the last few weeks. And if you're a small businessman or even a large businessman, particularly in the entertainment sector, how on earth you plan for the future, I really don't know. In terms of concrete steps, the first thing I would do is I'd put some economists on SAGE, and I might get rid of some of the existing medicos from SAGE, by the way, uh, and get some actually sceptical, educated attitudes to modelling and predictions. Now, going forward, how do we get out? I think that the economy will show uh, a lot of resilience. It has done already. It's bounced back quite a lot. Um, I think the two things I would say is, first of all, the government, in my view, must refrain from trying to bring the deficit and the debt ratio down quickly, leave them, uh, let them take care of themselves. In these conditions, I think, uh, you know, we can, we have the time. And the second thing to say, uh, my point of view is, I think that I would resist uh, a lot of funny little measures designed to boost jobs and growth. And I would, I'm a HS2 skeptic, I'm afraid. I think the best thing the government can do is lay out a framework for the future, and in particular, a framework with regard to taxes. In my view, the last thing that the government should be doing is contemplating big increases in tax. Thank you so much, Roger. Uh, Tasman, I think we have you back, so I'll hand it over to you. Sorry, um, I'm not sure how much of um, that you've got, uh, but I think, yeah, I did disconnect. Apologies for that. Um, so, um, so as, as the UK head of the corporate bank here at Barclays, I'm talking to UK corporates up and down the country about the challenges that they're facing and how they're navigating through the crisis so that we can better support them. Um, we've strived to support our clients and customers um, throughout the crisis and to have stood behind all of the government lending schemes, which to date means we facilitated approximately £24 billion worth of funding into the economy. That's super unprecedented. And you know that word is um, frequently used um, in the crisis, but just to put that into context, um, we did three years worth of lending um, in the first 12 weeks of the bounce back loan. Um, that really is unprecedented. And you can imagine the hard work 
that our teams had to put in to process these loans and, and they worked tirelessly throughout, sometimes with very difficult personal circumstances um, to, to, to get that done. And it, but it just reflects the scale of the crisis and how everyone came together to support the economy because um, the work we were doing was enabling people to stay in their jobs. In addition to the government schemes, we also put in quite a broad range of other support measures as well, such as repayment holidays, uh, free loans and um, waivers and things like that. And of course, we did carry on um, with our normal lending as well in, in fairly significant volumes, um, which, which gives me quite a lot of reason to be optimistic. Um, but as we know, the crisis is not over. Um, there is quite a lot of uncertainty around a second wave of infections as well as the UK's future relationship with Europe. And I think the combination of both of these is really creating a perfect storm for business. Um, so it is a nervous time for corporate Britain, uh, but we're listening and we're working really closely with uh, businesses to help them work things through. Thank you, Tasman. Uh, Jesse Norman, Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Let's have two or three minutes worth of your thoughts. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Kate, and thanks to The Spectator and to Barclays for putting on this uh, great uh, economic uh, and political jamboree uh, in virtual uh, space, but in real time. So thank you for that. Um, well, I, I and also thank you, Roger, for your very kind remarks about uh, the Treasury. I, I must say, uh, you know, um, talk about a pandemic to bring out the best energies of the civil service, but... Uh, you know, my officials and those of the Chancellor, Chief Secretary and other ministers, and in particular HMRC, which is for which I'm accountable within government, uh, I think have just done a phenomenal job. And uh, if, if someone had said we'd be able to get the kind of programmes out that we have done at very short notice, get the number of people furloughed and supported through the um, self-employed scheme and the other schemes, and then most recently to roll out this latest wave of uh, changes. Um, you know, if someone had said that even a few months ago, it would have been regarded as astonishing. So to have done it uh, since March uh, and under these circumstances, while HMRC itself has been rescaling, leaving the office uh, and dealing with COVID problems of its own uh, is remarkable. I think you all have seen that really there have been several phases. The, the furlough scheme was all about cushioning the impact of the initial shock on the economy and trying to uh, support people in their jobs and of course across wider society businesses uh, and, and families of, uh, as well uh, across a much wider array of government interventions. Now what you've seen last week uh, is uh, the latest response in between which is the, the, the support uh, scheme and various other changes we've made to uh, extend VAT and uh, uh, the bounce back loan schemes. But uh, of course, in between, we also had, uh, and this I think is a very important aspect that people are apt to forget, an enormous amount of work on uh, supporting jobs and uh, the plan for jobs. And, and our hope is that as we get through, as the economy mutates and develops, we will be able to make that transition as effectively and as smoothly uh, as we can. But as the Chancellor said, we simply are not in a position as a government to try to uh, pre prevent uh, or, or to be able to prevent um, the kind of uh, uh, damage that we may see in parts of the economy. And we can't uh, pr protect every job or every business. And that's a complete tragedy for the people involved. But I'm afraid it's the nature of being in a pandemic crisis of the kind that we are. What we can do is to work as, creativity, as, as creatively and as energetically as we can to make sure that from a government standpoint, every possible support is given to people by way of education and financial cushioning as they make a transition into uh, the jobs market of the future. Thank you, Jesse. And Ray Newton-Smith, Chief Economist at the Confederation of British Industry. Some thoughts from you. Uh Definitely. Well, well, thank you. And, and uh, thanks to the Spectator and, and Barclays uh, for hosting us uh, this morning. And, and I think I, I mean, I, I almost, it, it, it's rare to sort of start a panel saying I really agree with what everyone's sort of saying um, uh, so far. But I think maybe just to give a few quick reflections. And I, I completely agree. I think the work that uh, the Treasury and HMRC in particular have done to do at speed and scale is not something I ever would have expected 
um, to see it in my lifetime. But I think the real challenge for the economy at the moment, and, and I think we knew this was coming, um, is now some of the decisions and some of the choices I think get a lot harder. I think in the in initial phase of the crisis, everyone recognized we needed to use the financial system to build a bridge to the other side. We wanted to almost preserve the economy as it was and just get it over to the other side of this crisis. Um, and the other thing we absolutely needed was a mechanism to support employment, to support people's uh, jobs and, and to really minimize any uh, unemployment in that initial phase of the crisis. I think the challenge is we're now moving to the second phase and, and we there's two big challenges, right? We're seeing a rise in infection rates. I think the second wave that we all worried about uh, has maybe come a bit earlier and, and maybe with a bit more ferocity than some people had expected. And I think that's come as a shock to, to all of us. And then the second challenge is, is to what Jesse was saying, we can't save every existing job and every existing company. And that's a really tough message, particularly as this crisis plays out over, over time. But what you are now trying to do is get some of that dynamism back in the economy. And there are, and the other challenges, there are absolutely businesses that are growing. There are you know, even towns that are thriving, though there are some city centers that are really struggling at the moment. And this is the challenge. There are some within each sector, there are some businesses that are doing well at the moment, and there are some that are having such a tough time. And that is because of the fallout of the health crisis, but it's also because it is changing people's patterns of behavior and it's accelerating trends that were already out there from the move to, um, uh, you know, shopping online, as well as changing uh, more flexibility in, in people's working pattern. And I think how you use uh, government policy to soften some of that transition, but still allow some um, transitions to happen is the real uh, challenge that we face. And I think, you know, if I were talking about, uh, you know, if I've been talking at this, uh, this panel, maybe last Wednesday, I would have said what we need to see is, um, is a successor to the job retention scheme. I think we now have it. Um, you know, it's easy to say it's not perfect, but then the world isn't isn't uh, perfect either. I think there is a live conversation as to, you know, the hope is that will help to transition as many people back into the place of work uh, over the medium term while being cost effective. Um, but I think the chancellor may need to do more on that at some stage. Uh, but I think we need to see how this scheme works. I think the second big area was around pressures on businesses' cash flow. Uh, and we did see some important moves around that deferring VAT and extending the loan scheme from, you know, repayments over six, 10 years versus six years is, is huge to a lot of businesses. And I think there was a lot of detail last week that kind of got lost in um, some of the other measures that I think were really important. Um, but I think, you know, thinking to that long term, the, the area where we want to see the government invest, where they already have, is, is about the move to low carbon economy. I think the measures in the summer around the Greens Homes grants and thinking how we can use this opportunity to invest in our public infrastructure that is really geared towards that low um, transition economy, whether that's, you know, how retrofitting our homes, whether that's thinking about how we move around the country, the move to electric and other low emission vehicles, um, the whole future of, of mobility. And, and I think also, you know, moving ahead with some of the big infrastructure projects that we know we, we need to do. I think those sorts of things do give confidence um, to people and individuals over the long term. But I am sure there will be plenty of questions. There's lots uh, to debate. But I think that the challenge for everyone now is the very clear choices about what we need to do for the economy uh, you know, are no longer with us. We're now in this tricky point about how do we flatten the curve of unemployment? There will be an increase in unemployment. Um, and that's really challenging, I think, for the economy because that's something we haven't dealt with for many, many years now. Um, and so I do think the choices as we go ahead get really difficult. How do we, you know, help, don't put too much of a burden on, on a younger generation um, as we come out of this crisis uh, and how do we create opportunities around the UK remain some of the biggest challenges for our economy. Thanks. Well, we already have some questions rolling in from our audience, but I'm going to abuse my position as chair to ask each of you 
just a question or two. Um, Jesse, I'll, I'll come to you first. The front page of the Times newspaper today suggests that we could be looking at significantly stricter um, measures coming in to tackle the rise in COVID-19 cases. Um, there's talk of banning household mixing and even of shutting down the hospitality industry for at least two weeks, a circuit break in that industry. <laughs> Has the Treasury held back its firepower so that if you were to shut down entire sectors again, you could give them more generous subsidies to get through that? Or is the job support scheme the next phase? And now, regardless of what happens with COVID, there's no going back. Well, we are certainly committed to the job support scheme, and we will see that through. And it sits alongside a range of other policies, uh, including the um, uh, bonus and the uh, uh, also, of course, the bounce back loans and the VAT reliefs and the other reliefs we've announced. So and deferrals. So that policy framework is an expanding and uh, developing one. But <clears throat> I mean, the chance has made perfectly clear that uh, you know he. Uh, I think his phrase was uh, is prepared to get creative when the moment uh, demands it, and we've just seen that last week. And so you know, who can say what the future will bring. I would say, though, that it was quite noticeable that in uh, its commentary earlier in the crisis, the OECD pointed to the relatively strong state of the UK public finances relative to some of the other countries uh, that it surveys as being a cause for uh, durability and resilience. And um, that is, is an, in many ways, tribute to some of the good work that's been over the last done over the last 10 years. And so we certainly do have firepower if we need it, but uh, we, no one would want us to use it if we didn't have to. Well, Rain, you were calling for the government to extend or create a new furlough-like scheme. They have now brought in this job support scheme. Jesse's saying, you know, you don't want to use the firepower if you don't have to. Do you think they've used enough this time around? I think the, it, it's an impossible question to answer right now. And I think, as, as Jesse would say, in some sense, we have to see what happens. And I think what the Chancellor needs to, to do is stand ready to act uh, if, if necessary. I think what I can tell you from talking to businesses, both in the run up to the announcement on Thursday and, and since then, is this absolutely that um, the work support scheme will absolutely help uh, businesses, you know, whether it's there's manufacturers in uh, in the northwest who have said, look, it this will allow them to keep on more of their workers. They were facing, you know, had felt like they had to make tougher decisions in the end uh, of October. You know, airports, some of the uh, businesses that feed into uh, that supply chain. Um, this will really help a lot of businesses through what will be a really tough time. Um, I think the challenge is, and what we are hearing that's been commentary around this, is in, you know, in some of these uh, sectors where you have, uh, you know, I think what you want to do is to try and help, uh, you know, really flatten that curve of unemployment. But that doesn't mean that this will, it, businesses do have to make a contribution, right, to some of the non-worked hours. Um, and I think that is important. It's an important test for whether, you know, this, you see a future to your business that yes, we're in this period where demand is very weak because of the social distancing measures and, and because of how we are dealing with um, this health crisis. But it's not right that the government is, you know, is stepping in to save every single job because some of the trade-off as well is if, you, if, if the government is funneling in all the support for those jobs, there are people who lost their job back in March. There are young people coming into the labor market. And I think it is right that the government is also thinking about how they support those people. So I think it's a really tricky balancing act. It may, you know, it may, we may find out in a few weeks time that the, you know, the chancellor needs to take more action. But I think the other challenge is I absolutely agree what with what Roger was saying at the beginning, that we can tolerate a higher level of government debt. We're in a fortunate position where interest rates are very low. Um, but I think we are also getting to the stage where we do need to think about the impact on our public finances um, overall. And we need to make sure that whatever measures we put in place are targeted at firms who really are struggling because of this crisis and not you know, move away from some of the generalized support. We will certainly come back to the public finances. Uh, but first, Tasnim, I wanted to ask or pick you up on a point. You, you mentioned that 
Barclays had given out an unprecedented number of business loans uh, just in the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic hitting the UK. As we go into the winter months and as it looks like we're only going to get more restrictions, not fewer on how businesses can operate and how we can live our lives, do you think there needs to be stricter criteria for the kinds of loans that are going to be dished out to business? Um, so the, the criteria that um, um, were being used were, were, were fairly targeted, I, I would say, um, in, in, in the first instance anyway. Um, and certainly on the Siebel's um, and that we were having to follow um, fairly strict criteria as laid out by the British Business Bank around um, affordability, because um, certainly um, we, you know, we, would, we would all be concerned about businesses borrowing more um, than they could afford um, to pay back. But, but I think, um, you know, as um, Rain just, just highlighted, um, I, th I think the, the support that was provided over the summer um, kind of provided emergency funding to kind of secure the short term um, support that um, businesses needed. Um, and what we what we found is that um, that's that's taken some of the panic out of um, the, you know, the immediate panic um, away, away from businesses. And um, some of the businesses have been using that funding um, to pay suppliers um, to secure um, to top up on the furloughs um, and but I, th I think that there, there is definitely a, dif a d differentiation between businesses that uh, for which COVID is um, call it a temporary um, effect versus um, businesses that even pre-COVID were going through their own um, kind of transformation um, anyway and needed um, to kind of keep adapting and innovating. And, and, and those businesses, um, you know, will need to continue um, to do that, um, you know, using some government support, but also um, um, the support um, from, 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 from the businesses themselves um, as well. I think one of my clients um, uh, in the hospitality industry um, said, said something to me, which is sort of stuck in my head, which is that, um, COVID um, and the crisis was never a time to kind of earn, but it was a time to learn and adapt and, and kind of innovate. Um, and, and, and I think the good businesses out there have been using, um, you know, the crisis um, in, in, in as much positive way as possible and really using these support measures to kind of really innovate and kind of pivot their business um, to, to kind of newer business models. Roger, you mentioned in your opening remarks and, and Rain picked up on it that we shouldn't worry about the debt to GDP ratio right now. Treat this more as a one off wartime spend. It's not in theory anyway going to turn into a structural deficit problem. But the job support scheme starts in November and is going to last for six months, which brings us well into 2021. It, it looks increasingly like we are increasing structural spending. So perhaps we don't care about the debt to, DD, debt to GDP ratio, but should we be increasingly concerned about costs ticking up in the years to come? Oh, Roger, you're on mute. There we um, go. When I was saying earlier on that I don't think we should be too worried about the deficit and the debt ratio, that doesn't mean to say that I think they don't matter at all. There are some people around who've suggested that, you know, and there's this thing called modern monetary theory that seems to suggest to me, or they think anyway, that um, you can go on having the central bank financing this stuff ad infinitum and there's never a problem. Now, I don't agree with that. So, you know, the Treasury and the rest of us have got to keep a weather eye on the debt ratio. Um, and yeah, I think there are some, there have been some signs over recent months. Uh, some Conservative MPs and other people actually with inside and outside Parliament thinking that we've now got a free pass and it doesn't matter, we can let the deficit do whatever it wants. That's not my view. And I think uh, because we have got to be concerned about the long term, uh, I think we have to spend, I think various people have said this, uh, Jesse Norman said it, other people in the panel said it, we've got to, Rain said it, we've got to target support and make sure that we don't just splurge money because although you know, Bank of England buying this debt may give the impression that it's free, eventually it's not. But I think it's a difficult balance to strike. I would not be worried about the debt ratio. I mean, I'd be more worried about um, the point you're making to make sure that the structural deficit shows every prospect of not coming down now, it's much too soon, but uh, the, 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 we, we can see into the future that this is not gonna be a problem. I think that's the big issue. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Jesse, we have a question from Andrew, speaking of that targeted support, who's saying, what about the entertainment and events industries? It's near impossible at the moment anyway, to see when those industries can come back and operate in a meaningful way. If your business essentially can't operate or it is illegal to operate because it's not possible to do so without breaking social distancing rules and guidelines to set out by government, isn't there a case not to wait to see how they fare, but to give more subsidy now? Well, uh, thanks to Andrew very much for the question. And of course, I massively feel the concern as someone who has been involved in the arts in many different ways for, for decades, including as a board member of the Roundhouse in London, which uh, was a project of my father's. So I, I completely understand. I think the problem is, um, uh, of course, that we are in a pandemic environment in which live events in particular and getting people together into the same room uh, is extremely problematic and all the more so in a second wave. Now, the, the government has generally taken the view that, uh, you know, where, where it has had to uh, impose social restrictions, it is appropriate to try to provide support through the economic system in many ways uh, as it can. And it has done so. Of course, in the area that uh, Andrew's talking about, uh, we announced a 1.6 billion pound support package a few weeks ago, which I, I suspect was probably twice as large as anyone was expecting at the time, and was certainly uh, greeted with um, great uh, acclamation and relief by those involved. And its function was not just to support the, the biggest anchor institutions across the country, it was also to support the, the local institutions that are anchoring individual communities and the companies associated with them. So th that is the main thrust of the policy in this area so far. But of course, many people who are um, in that sector can also benefit from the other schemes that we've put in place. Uh, and I know that many were uh, in the self-employment scheme or were furloughed through other schemes uh, and uh, hopefully will be in a position to, to benefit uh, if not directly now, then certainly uh, from the other schemes that we've put forward going f uh, in, in future. Uh, Rain, risk, uh, Rich has written in asking about the generational divide. Uh, it was an issue, or many thought it was anyway, before the COVID crisis. We were talking about intergenerational unfairness, particularly as it relates to the housing market, but in lots of different aspects of life. And it seems that will be even greater once we come out of this crisis. Uh, a, a lot of the um, calculations so far suggest that young people are going to be most likely to lose their jobs in the short, medium and long term. Um, what can we be doing to mitigate this? Um, certainly from the economic perspective, what interventions do you think would be possible? But also, is there any area where we could perhaps roll back some of our interventions to make the economy a bit more free and to help young people get a foot up on the ladder. So there, there's a lot uh, in, in that, that question and, and you're absolutely right. I think before we went into this crisis, there was a, a challenge around the experience of, of different generations and uh, younger generations, partly because they came into, if you think about the millennial generation came into the labor market after the global financial crisis, um, often, or, or at least some of that generation and the generation after it. Um, and so what they they were already experiencing some scarring effects from that and, and lower pay at the age of 30 than, than previous uh, generations. Um, and and uh, because they entered the labor market when at, at a really tough time. And I think now you're, you're going to see a, a similar generation entering the, the labor market when let's hope that, you know, we don't see what, what we saw after what Paul Johnson at the IFS calls the dismal decade after the global financial crisis, where uh, pay growth was subdued almost for uh, a decade. I hope that once we come out of this crisis, we'll see a more rapid uh, recovery. But I think what is clear is if you're leaving university now, if you're coming in, it, you are coming in at a, a labour market that is tougher than we've ever seen for many a generation uh, in the UK. And, and there could well be scarring effects. And I think... That's why you know the chancellor announced in in the summer the Kickstarter scheme, uh, which is a, where the government will pay for essentially for any young person who's been unemployed for a period of six months or more, they will cover your wages um, uh, for a six month placement. Which then the idea is hopefully that converts into a job and it builds in a successful scheme after 
the last financial crisis, but actually even in, in Wales, they have something called the Jobs Growth Fund, which is quite successful at getting young people into employment. So I think we absolutely need to see that scheme work. I think one of the ways you could make that more flexible is, and I think they've already altered it a little bit, is making it easier for SMEs to, to do that. I think, um, at the, you know, originally you needed to have at least 30 placements offered as part of that scheme. You could come together with other small businesses. But I think there's really something to be said. And we've heard it from some of our members who've said, look, we'd love to do the scheme, but re realistically, we're only going to take on one person, but we'd love to give that opportunity to a young person. So thinking about how we can really make that work for smaller businesses, I think would be um, great. I think the other thing we absolutely need to do is prioritize keeping our schools open. Um, and I think the government has come around to understanding that. I don't um, I think initially, I'm not sure we saw why that was so important to do as, as quickly as we could. But now I think that is a clear priority and that is so, so important um, just because of the scarring effects of particularly lower income households where they may not have the facilities at home to do homeschooling in, in the way that other households have. Um, so that's vital. I think we do need to think about the experience of, of those at universities, but also the role of FE colleges and, and how we can make sure that uh, they can sort of help with uh, retraining for, for young people, but also more broadly. So I don't think there's any easy answers to the intergenerational challenge, but I think we, I think it's important that we recognize that yes, the health implications of this crisis are much more weighted to the older generations um, and we really need to protect their health, but actually the costs in terms of the labor market and some and and around mental health and lost experience i think is really being borne by young people so i think we need really need to think about that and bear that in mind and and it, it is something that needs to be considered as we're looking at some of these policies is how does this particular policy you know impact on uh you know people who are 60 and above how does it impact you know people in their 20s i think we do need to look at these and think about uh, the implications, because it's important for, uh, you know, how we come out of this crisis. Uh, Tasnim, what insight can you share with us about the the state of personal finance right now? Um, there's reports that some people have done very well uh, economically out of the COVID-19 crisis, but many more uh, are struggling. I'm thinking of young people in particular, many of whom may have just gone into debt to go to university and are now quite literally being held in their in their rooms on campus um but for young workers as well i mean what are the long-term implications for their financial burden going into the future as they perhaps have lost their job or struggling to save um and and how can we help to support them and and, and mitigate that pain So um, I think one of the things we're really proud about um, at Barclays is that we have continued with our apprenticeship programs, uh, which have been going for, uh, for, for a few years, and we have continued to recruit graduates um, onto all of our schemes. Um, and we had over 1,000 um, um, interns join just um, this summer, actually, which um, is, is, is um, you know, a, a number we're very proud of. Um, I think, um, you know, it's, it, it is fair to say that the impact um, on young people, um, only time will tell actually as to what the, what the real um, impact is. Um, I mean, some insight I can give you is that even some of our younger people here at Barclays, um, you know, we're having to go above and beyond to make sure that um, they get the full kind of experience because when you're working from home in a solitary environment, it's really hard to kind of learn because um, you know, I used to be a graduate at some point joining, you know, knowing nothing. And um, you, you learn a lot by being part of a team, by watching others, by, you know, people kind of taking you under their wing. And, you know, those kind of experiences, even for the young people that are in work right now, and are, are kind of not happening. Um, and, and, and then, of course, um, you know, with, with, with businesses closed or whatever, there's just less opportunities uh, for people to go in to go into um, on your point about sort of personal finance I think um, as you mentioned it is um, I would say a story of two halves in that you know clearly there are some people that are really struggling um, you know the furlough payments um, whilst good it's quite restricted in terms of the amount um, that can be claimed under furlough and um, you know who knows what commitments 
um, people may have for mortgages and things like that, it might just not um, be enough um, to, to pay away. But equally, there are other people who um, perhaps, you know, would have spent a lot of money on a holiday um, and were unable to take it and um, have, have been able to kind of save a lot of, of, of money as well. And, and that's, you know, we're, we're sort of seeing um, um, money in in deposit accounts kind of rising quite significantly um, as, as, as well. Um, and that, so I think it's a story of, of, of kind of two halves, Kate. Well, there's talk now of the K-shaped recovery, some doing very well and some doing very poorly <laughs> out of this crisis. And that, that is actually one to, one to look out for. Roger, uh, we have a question from Peter who's asking why aren't the more innovative and entrepreneurial businesses being rewarded for how they adapted during the crisis? I guess the first question is, do you agree with Peter that they're not being rewarded or, or recognized? And if we wanted to reward them more, why do we keep hearing briefings about potential tax rises in the future? Shouldn't we be giving these businesses that adapted tax cuts? Well, I've got a lot of sympathy with that view, although um, I don't like the idea of specific rewards. That's to say, you know, the government sits there as a headmaster looking at the class and thinking about which of the jolly good pupils, right, yes, we're going to help you along. I don't think that's the way it should be at all. Um, but I absolutely agree with the sentiment that the questioner expressed about taxes. Now, maybe, you know, across the board tax cuts, I don't think we're quite in the territory for that. But I absolutely agree that the, and I mentioned it before, uh, not that many weeks ago, there were lots of stories in the press. We don't know quite where they emanated from, but there was speculation that they emanated from very high places in the Treasury, um, that there was going to be a raft of tax rises uh, before very long. Uh, and it was going to include increased taxes uh, on uh, increased capital gains tax, a whole series of other things that would um, have a serious effect on business people and entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think that's precisely the wrong way to go. I think we need a forward-looking tax plan this is a conservative government. I think uh, business would benefit a lot, need encouragement or rewards. I think it needs to know where we're going. It needs to be confident that uh, people can keep the bulk of what they justifiably earn, the gains they make. That's the key thing. And they're not going to be clobbered in the future by some raft of new tax rises. That's, I think, the, what the conservative government should be doing. Jesse, this is a conservative government, so surely you're in agreement with Roger that tax rises should not be on the agenda, especially for these businesses that innovated and made sure that supply chains held up and that we were supported throughout the crisis. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Kate, for that uh, encouragement to um, discuss uh, Treasury tax policy in advance of fiscal events. As you all know, uh, we never do that. And so I hope you don't mind if I don't do it now. I, I also would say that it's another great Treasury policy never to comment on um, speculation about tax rises, which is endemic in a, uh, a, a world of media that is as lively and energised as ours, and of course, energised heavily in part by the spectator. So um, I'm not going to comment on that either. I do think um, specific rewards for entrepreneurial businesses from government are, is, a, is an appalling idea. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, recognition when people have done a great job is a, is is a wonderful thing. But the beautiful thing about the um, our commercial society and our capital system is that recognition reward comes by doing a good job. The market gives it to you, and that's what we should be encouraging. Um, so I, I don't accept that. What's interesting, I take the point Roger makes about certainty and stability. And of course, he's absolutely right that under normal circumstances, the more certainty you can give people in their taxes, the more um, uh, you can allow them to plan. And planning is good because it allows uh, investment and therefore the system to uh, function more effectively and smoothly. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that when you're in a pandemic where uncertainty is off the charts and, uh, you know, your fiscal numbers are going up and down like a seesaw, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of planning for more than uh, a relatively short period is uh, just not uh, uh, doable. But what I think is doable and what we have done elsewhere uh, is to think about what the structure of taxes and of our tax administration might be in the longer term. And uh, no one will have noticed it, but we published just before uh, uh, summer a 10-year uh, plan for reform of the tax administration framework, which is about the digitization of the tax system and um, the use of data and improving uh, how HMRC interacts with 
uh, individuals uh, digitally and otherwise. And that won't just improve customer service from HMRC, it'll make an enormous difference to our resilience as a nation because we'll be gathering information uh, in real time much more than we do at the moment. And uh, it'll also mean that uh, we can very gently give a, a kind of a nudge to businesses that might be not quite as digital as they should be through the tax system to um, invest a little more. And once you do that, who knows where that uh, digital nudge might not lead them in terms of their own future productivity and um, well-being. So uh, there are things we can do and we are doing many of them, but uh, what we're not going to do is start discussing long-term tax strategy at this particular moment. Well, let me ask you this, Jesse. The, the Chancellor has postponed the budget and replaced it with a, a winter economy plan, uh, surely because of the, to your point, uh, we're simply not in a position to really know what's coming down the track, how much more spending could be needed and, and, and the consequences for that. But you speak of certainty. And uh, whilst we cannot be certain what will happen this winter with COVID-19, is the government in a position of strength to deal with the uncertainty of COVID-19 and the uncertainty of a no-deal Brexit at the same time? Well, I think the government is fully capable of doing more than one thing at a time. And uh, this is a, uh, an environment in which uh, uh, planned arrangements are coinciding with unplanned. Uh, events and you know governments in British history over the years have been in um, uh, uh, turbulent times at least as turbulent as these and uh, I don't think we will um, uh, fail to rise to the challenge as the moment comes. I mean I think what I would say of course is that uh, if you are um, thinking about the future it is a brave person who would say anything other than that we are at a time what John Kay and Mervyn King called radical uncertainty. And uh, that isn't the same thing as risk. And so to make the mistake of assimilating it to the normal risk models is to make the mistake that um, uh, many uh, bankers have made. And uh, Tasney may want to comment on this to their, to their sorrow and horror over the years because they're not the same thing as we discovered in 2008. Let's uh, move to the impact that the COVID-19 crisis has had on workers, specifically those who were told to go home. Um, Rain, Nigel asks, how do you see home and office work split and evolving over the next five years? Uh, surely this crisis, uh, as we've seen, has um, not only encourage more people to work from home, but has really moved things forward on that front. Uh, but do you see us, if there were, say, to be a vaccine or a silver bullet to COVID-19, returning to the office in the way that we did before? Do you think something's changed? No, I, I think something has fundamentally shifted. And in some ways, it's accelerated a trend that was already there in terms of more flexibility and where it's possible people working um, from home or having this sort of, I would call it a mixed mode approach, because I think it's also shown us uh, some of the challenges when you don't see your colleagues for months on end. Um, and, and that's also a really tough place uh, to be. So it is this balanced mode. And I think the, the first thing I'd say is what we're talking about is the 35, 40% of the economy, where it's relatively easy to work from home, professional services, IT, etc. And I think we have to recognize, you know, key workers who and, and many others in manufacturing and elsewhere who need to to be in a physical place of work to do their to do their job. Um, but of that 40 percent of the economy, um, what we're sort of finding from from businesses is they're saying, look, you, over the medium run, we think, you know, the overall capacity we need in terms of office space is probably seven, you know, around 70 percent of of what it was and I think it you know in general people are are thinking about a mixed mode yes there may be some people in those uh, businesses who who go into the office every day maybe because you know particularly younger people uh, as well maybe in shared accommodation uh, where, where being in the office um, you know is beneficial to them working effectively but I think you'll find the majority of people will have a mixed mode maybe coming into the office a couple of days a week working from home the other uh, period of time. Um, and, and I think what we have seen, and I'm sure Tasneem can can speak to this, and I absolutely know from what we've seen in financial services, I mean, they truly went overnight um, to being able to function from home, which was amazing. Um, uh, but I think it's also shown, you know, what has been possible, and that's happened across a, a range of sectors. So I don't think we will sort of go back. It has on the positives, it's really helped kind of digital adoption, you know, the way we're doing uh, this virtually, there's so many examples of, of how businesses have 
use some of the digital technologies that are out there to, to keep their teams uh, connected. But I think it, it has also shown, you know, it is hard to collaborate with a team creatively when you're all uh, separated. People miss just seeing each other and, and being able to make those very human connections that's harder to do over Zoom. So I don't think the office is dead. It won't die. It will come back, uh, you know, once this health crisis is behind us, but it will come back in a very different way to, to where it was uh, before. Uh, absolutely. Well, Tasnim, it would be very interesting to hear your experience working with companies, especially those struggling, how you think they've adapted to working from home. Um, obviously, the, the, the larger companies, the ones with more resources surely had an easier time of it, but perhaps those smaller companies did struggle quite a bit. And people seem to be um, quite passionate often about where they fall on this, those who want to come back to the office, those who think that home working is, is the future. So how do you think businesses are going about having those conversations right now? Um, so I think I, I totally agree with the point that uh, Rain was just making. Um, the role of the office, I think, has changed forever um, going forward. Um, I, I think, um, you know, having um, particularly in sort of, you know, standard kind of office roles, I'm going to say, um, having five days a week um, in the office, I think is just not going to going to be happening um, going forward. Um, I mean, we... Uh, we, as well as our clients, um, literally at a flick of a switch um, on March 23rd, went from almost everybody in the office to everybody at home, um, pretty much. And um, I think we sort of probably surprised ourselves at um, how effectively we were able to do that and stand that up. Um, and particularly, you know, if, if I think about um, the heavy workload we had with all the government scheme work that needed to be done exactly in parallel as, as, as setting up people from home. Um, I mean, it was kind of amazing, really reflecting back on it, what, um, what was achieved. I mean, there were certain roles um, that we would have in the past kind of thinking designated as 100% office-based roles, um, even though we've really supposed, you know, supported dynamic working for many years, but even those roles um, were actually quite fine um, working, from, kind of working from home. And so I, th I think it's it's really made us think about um, what the role of the office is going forward. I think it's not going to be a place where you go to do your solitary work. It, it will be there far more for um, collaboration, um, for meeting in big groups and um, training and um, developing people. Um, and then the other thing, um, just from a, a client and customer perspective, um, I, I, th I think the digital adoption that um, was accelerated through this period was, was, was really, you know, fantastic. Um, and, um, you know, clients that were sort of uh, thinking about becoming a bit more digital, you know, using technology such as DocuSign, as an example, moving away from wet signatures. Um, and, you know, if I think about some of um, both our internal processes as, as well as processes that our clients have, there's a lot of physical signing that, 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 that we do that kind of delays things. And all those things became kind of instant um, uh, with you know, leveraging some of these te te technologies. And so I, I think um, um, it did accelerate a, um, a, a trend that I think is going to be permanent um, you know, feature for all of us. And, and, but I think the, the, the office is not, not dead um, as, as, a, as a place. I think you know, that it will have a, a significant role, but it will not be uh, what we're used to. Uh, Roger, Tasnim makes an, a very important point there that this has been that big push that some companies needed to embrace mm -hmm. uh, digitalization. Um, this may well improve productivity across yeah. the board in the UK. However, perhaps the flip side of that is that as things move online, and um, not in every case, but certainly in some cases, employers may realize where they can make efficiency gains, and that might actually mean fewer employees. Well, in the short term, it might mean fewer employees, but you know the system has a way of coping with that. People lose their jobs, other jobs are created. I agree with you. I think there are positive sides to this ghastly event, and we will see increased productivity. Um, but we can't tell in advance. Um, this is the sense in which, going back to what Jesse and others were saying about the Treasury not being able to keep every job going, or every sector, or every business going, it shouldn't try, because 
Um, this is, if you like, a, a pure, in some ways, it's a pure Hayek, Hayekian event in that there's a major structural change going on in the economy. And we none of us know how it's all going to pan out, frankly. Well, this business of office working, it affects you know, location where you're going to live. It affects the need for commuter networks. It affects the need for retailing. It affects uh, entertainment, uh, food industry. It affects everything. And I think we have to, it's painful, but I think we have to wait and see what people want to do. And in the end, we'll find out. The market will tell us. People's preferences will tell us. But that's going to, uh, I think it's going to affect massive structural change. And going back to the beginning of uh, this session is one of the reasons why this is just not an ordinary downturn by any manner or means. It's not just a shortage of demand. Um, it's actually affecting massive structural change. And we don't know quite how all that's going to pan out. So I, I think the Treasury's approach so far is basically right. It's, it's done the right thing with regard to supporting jobs. It's been pretty generous in the amounts. But what I don't think it should be doing is saying, right, we must give a whole load of support to, uh, you know, the, the, the provision of food or uh, inner city working or, or whatever, because we just don't know how these sectors, frankly, are going to be in the future. And the product, the future productivity of the British economy depends upon uh, us not keeping going dead sectors and dead firms. Uh, it, it depends upon a certain amount of flexibility and dynamism. Jesse, to Roger's point there, the economy has to be allowed to change as people's preferences change, as the way that they demand goods and services change. That's very hard to know, however, in the midst of a pandemic, which mm. I suppose speaks to the the furlough scheme and, and, and the job support scheme. Um, but at what point, especially if a vaccine does not appear to be as quickly on the horizon as I'm sure many in government and, and all of us would like it to be, at what point does the treasury and, and, and other bodies in the government say, you know what, we just have to let the economy start to adapt now and we need to stop trying to hold on to the way it was before? Well, in many ways, uh, Kate, the treasury has uh, made that acknowledgement uh, already. I mean, last week was a clear recognition that we would move um, from a situation in which, uh, which I think Andy Held and Andy Held ended characterised, you know, a, a system of life support, to a system of uh, job subsidy, which does allow us to um, support uh, change in the market economy. And, and as Roger says, I mean, markets are fantastically flexible things. And there are many, many jobs out there at the moment that would never have been imagined, dreamt of even 15 years ago. Uh, and there will, of course, in 10 years time, 15 years time, be the same jobs. And um, the astonishing thing about the last 10 years has been the flexibility and the effectiveness of the British labour markets. And that uh, has allowed uh, an astonishing growth of, of in many ways, um, actually quite good quality uh, employment. It's often underestimated how good the employment has been. There's, uh, the caricature is that everyone's on zero hours contracts. That's simply not true. The majority of jobs have been full-time jobs. So there will be a tremendous amount of further change. And we have to allow the energy and the resilience and the genius of um, people and businesses and families and to, to adapt to the situation and not try to freeze them in some cryogenic suspended animation. Because uh, although that is appropriate, when you're looking at the first shock at thinking about how you deal with this astonishing impact and process of change, people are resourceful, they do change, they adapt, and they're already doing that very rapidly as we've seen. Now, just to pick up some of the themes that have just been touched on, rightly so, um, I would worry very much about the impact of working from home on what you might call normal breakthrough processes of market development. Young people, you know, elbowing their way through the door saying, believe me, if I got a great idea for you and you need to, how about this? Because what it really means is that people are operating within their own, often with their own technology bubbles and the kind of charm and energy that the system relies on uh, to promote new ideas and new schemes doesn't seem to exist in quite the same way. But that too will, that too will evolve and we have to try to find ways of making even the system we have as it develops as permeable to new ideas, as open, as energizable, uh, and as productive as it can be. And one of the things that we're apt to do is just forget the past. I mean, even the 
uh, crisis of 2008 was very unlike the crises we had in the 1990s. It was a balance sheet recession where the bottom fell out of value across the economy in a way that it wasn't, it wasn't a PL classic, uh, uh, as it were, recession of the kind that we'd seen in the 80s and 90s. So there are differences there. And one of the things that we need to do as policymakers is constantly be refreshing our understanding of the present by thinking about the past and then trying to speculate imaginatively, hopefully. Uh, um, without spending too much public money in speculating about what the future might be and how we can support it. And I absolutely don't think we should be backing the, the as it were, the hypothetical winners of the future. But I think one of the things we can do is be really proactive and energized about supporting technologies we know are right on the cusp of development. And that's one of the things that we'll be doing, uh, I'm sure, in the next few years and that we'll be discussing in our national infrastructure strategy when we publish it later this year. We only have two minutes left, so truly 30 seconds from each of you just to go around. Um, looking to the winter, uh, you know, being realistic about the situation, seeing the direction that the wind is blowing. What is um, a support scheme or a rollback or some kind of change or intervention that you think could help get us through the next phase of the crisis? Rain, I'll start with you. So I, I think just just be prepared to be agile uh, as as we have been and, and you know, evolve the job support scheme if we have. But I think we do need to be in this evolution of supporting people in work, supporting job creation, rather than just trying to preserve the economy as it was back in, in March. Um, and I think also think about the no regrets action. I know it isn't the time for tax rises, but you you know, we could be consulting about fuel duty, about the alignment between employment and self-employment, about the, the challenges from business rates. Uh, you know, there's so many things this crisis has shown, you know, we know we need to consult and change over the medium term. We could get on and, and, and consult uh, on those. Um, and, and I think finally, you know, uh, probably remiss if I don't sort of mention Brexit. I think, look, there's been some really good signs recently and, and noises in the last few days about getting a deal. Let's hope we get absolutely get a deal, because I think for businesses trying to, you know, build up stockpiles at this time as we head into winter is just really, really challenging. So I think we all have our fingers and toes crossed that we get that deal uh, across the line and, and soon. So businesses can really focus on creating that dynamic economy that we want for the future and, and looking to the, the wide world as well. Tasnim? So I think the most important thing for, for, for me um, from a business perspective is we, we need to find a way of um, getting confidence back um, in our businesses um, here in the UK um, and to create as much certainty as, 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 as is possible. Um, and, you know, I know it's a bro broken record around, you know, probably sound like a broken record around um, um, the future relationship with Europe, as well as the pandemic, but as much certainty as we can build around how that will all play out will just enable businesses to plan um, for the future um, in the short, the medium and the, and the long term. And we need to kind of encourage businesses to start investing again. Um, and, and they will only invest um, if there is confidence um, and, and they can kind of see a path um, to realising the return on their investments. Um, I think um, having um, some of the transitional measures, some of which have already been announced, which I do welcome, um, so that there's no kind of cliff edge that businesses feel, whether, you know, um, I think it's very welcome that there was no cliff edge for the VAT um, and that, you know, furlough has been replaced with something else. Um, and so I think, you know, those kind of measures are, are, are just helping provide that kind of transition. And, you know, I think through um, the next couple of months, um, any, anything more that could be done to build that confidence, I think is going to be vital. Roger? Yes, if I can just briefly pick up on the Brexit issue. I'm, of course, a uh, Brexiteer, and I'm enthusiastic about us leaving, even if we leave without a deal, although I hope we do get a deal. Um, I don't actually think it matters a great deal. There's one thing I want to say. If we don't get a deal, um, rather have one than not have one. But I think this um, pandemic has shown pretty clearly how comparatively irrelevant Brexit is in the immediate short term. Frankly, it's on a different order of magnitude for the short term impact compared to the pandemic. That's a really big economic issue before us. Um, if I can come back to tax briefly, I accept what Jesse Norman said about it's hardly the time for the Treasury to be announcing uh, you know, a, a tax plan. 
But I'm conscious, and I've written about this many times, in the years before the pandemic, the Treasury didn't have a forward tax plan either, uh, apart from, apart from uh, I think, helpfully announcing forward plans for corporation tax. Now, contrast this with what it did with government spending. The Treasury's had umpteen plans, even though there's economic uncertainty. It's laid down. You know, what's going to happen to government spending overall, to government borrowing? You go back to Mrs. Thatcher's government, they laid down detailed plans year after year. What was going to happen to government borrowing? It was the tax burden and particular taxes that squared the circle. That was just left to spend for itself. I think the Treasury needs to reverse this. I think it needs to start with tax. And Jesse? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm very grateful to Roger for that uh, stirring ending. And uh, uh, I think um, some of the points he makes there are uh, well aimed. Uh, I would say this, uh, uh, listen, the Treasury has put a lot of policy out in the last few days, let alone the last few weeks. So I'm not going to comment on new policies for the winter. Uh, my focus actually is going to be something slightly different, which is just to try to make sure that the uh, entity for which I'm accountable, HMRC, and the National Infrastructure Strategy, which I am supposed to be responsible for, and uh, other parts of the Treasury and its officials are in fighting fit, good order, well-rested, uh, energized, enthused, um, and, and, and hopefully able to have some sleep after their energy has lost a few weeks, because we need those organizations to be operating at absolutely peak, peak fitness and effectiveness. And we're gonna to continue to need them to be in that situation and in that form for the next few months. And so um, it's not a policy that I'm gonna be focusing on, it's, it's the overall fitness and energy of the teams, because that's what's gonna determine our capacity to respond to change in a really agile and effective way. Well, I'm very sorry that we can't thank our panel in the usual way, but I hope that everybody watching at home will join me in thanking Tasnim, Rain, Jesse, and Roger for some fascinating insights about how we eventually come to recover from this COVID crisis and how we can boost the economy. Um, thank you again to Barclays for sponsoring this panel and this morning. Uh, if you're watching at home, go grab a cup of coffee, grab a glass of water because in 10 minutes we'll be heading into our second panel also sponsored by Bar Barclays about global trade, uh, the UK's trade plans after Brexit featuring Trade Secretary Liz Truss. So thank you so much to our panel for joining me. Thank you to our watchers and stay tuned on Spectator TV.